Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm Jerry McDermott. I'm a professor of international business and uh, the, uh, one of the faculty members involved with the Folk Center for International Business. And as some of you may know, the Folk Center has been growing slowly but steadily over the past four years, and uh, we regularly try to bring you, the students in the public, and the greater community of USC, uh, a variety of events about key issues in international business and international affairs. And uh, as usual, uh, in the past, uh, I would like to also put on notice that uh, this event is supported by the Rachel and Jim Hodges Forum on International Affairs. And I would like to ask uh, Rachel Hodges to stand for us if we all salute her. Give her a round of applause. The Hodges have always supported us uh, in this institution thoroughly over the years, and especially in international business and international affairs. Uh, so, Vladimir Putin and the future of Europe, the new hybrid war, that's the topic today, a sort of boring, trivial topic, it seems. Uh, before I introduce Mitchell, I also want to introduce uh, my two colleagues, uh, Professor Bob Cox from political science and also the director of the Walker Institute for International and Area Studies, as well as Stanislav Marcus, uh, associate professor of international business. They'll be providing some comments briefly after Mitch's talk, and then we're going to turn it open over to you, all of you, for Q&A with Mitch. So I first met Mitch. Um, well, I saw him coming, as you can imagine. You don't sort of meet him. You see his presence coming. It was a dark alleyway, misty. It was November of 93. The Stasi files had just been looted, and of course, Mitch was there to pick up the pieces. Um, sort of true, actually. Uh, we've gone back many years. But as you may have seen, Mitch Orenstein has an incredible, illustrious career over the past 25 years. He's a professor of Russian and East European Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. He got his BA from a little place called Harvard and a PhD from the rival Yale in comparative politics. Uh, he's published numerous articles in some of the most prestigious academic journals, as well as uh, authored five books and edited four. Uh, two of them were prize-winning books. And his most recent book, which, he's, uh, which is sort of the background and architecture for today's talk, has been uh, already acclaimed. Uh, for instance, the Washington Book Review called uh, it a seminal study of the post-Cold War political rivalry between the West and Russia, uh, as well as uh, the Brookings Institute, institution, which many of you know in, in public policy, uh, calls it a must read for longtime students of Eastern Europe and those only now realizing its geopolitical significance. So without any further delay, I'm going to hand everything over to Mitch. And uh, let us first give him a round of applause to get him going. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, I would like to uh, you know, specifically thank uh, Rachel and Jim Hodges uh, for sponsoring this series. Thanks to Jerry, an old friend uh, from uh, we knew each other as PhD students first in, in Eastern Europe, starting in the early 1990s. And uh, Karen Brocious and the Folk Center, uh, as well as all the other uh, organizations at University of South Carolina contributed to, to bringing me here and, and to my uh, commentators, to Bob and, uh, and to Stan, both of whom are also uh, friends and colleagues. Um, and I just say that because I don't want them to be too harsh on me when I... <laughs> so... Um, so uh, I, what I'm talking about today is, of course, an issue which is on the front pages of most uh, magazines and newspapers. And I'm going to, um, it's, huh, this didn't do what I expected it to do. Maybe it's that way, OK. And um, my remarks are based on this recent book I've published, The Lands in Between, uh, Russia versus the West and the New Politics of Hybrid War. So. Um, in this uh, talk, I'm going to focus on a few questions, a few key questions, 
which I think are really important framing or background questions to understand uh, what's going on in the world today. In particular, I want to focus on what is at stake in the kind of emerging conflict between Russia and the West. Why is Russia seeming to be acting so aggressively in international affairs, including attacking, say, the US uh, presidential election in 2016? And what are the tools of its hybrid war? How does it, how does it seek to achieve its objectives? And also what impact it has on our politics. And when I talk about our politics, I'm not only talking about the United States. So the book I consider about 20 other European countries as well as the United States. And so I'm talking broadly about, um, about politics in the West in general. So because um, uh, Jerry's gonna be, I think, timekeeper today and he's gonna try and keep me honest here to you know, say 30 or 40 minutes. Um, and uh, because I tend to really go on and on and on, I'm, I, I could talk for five hours about this stuff. I think you'll see that. Um, I, I decided that the best strategy for me is just to tell you what I'm going to say right at the beginning. So when Jerry cuts me off, um, you know, you won't you won't necessarily lose anything. And so I'm going to argue that um, that uh, the what's really at stake in this conflict between Russia and the West is that Russia wishes to replace the institutions, the European Union and NATO institutions that guarantee European security. This conflict is basically about European security. It's not about the US election exactly. Uh, Russia is um, acting very aggressively in part because it feels existentially threatened and challenged by uh, the way things are right now in Europe. It uses a very wide variety of tools to advance its interests um, that go beyond what everybody's heard about was social media and, um, and computer hacking. And then, but I'm, where I want to get to, and I hope I have enough time to get into this, is that this, this project ultimately presents a kind of model of how this emerging conflict has affected our politics. And I, and I talk about, I develop that largely through looking at the frontline states. In other words, those countries in between Russia and the European Union that have been on the front lines of an emerging divide uh, for quite a, quite a long time and uh, have been deeply affected uh, by a lot of the same things that Western countries are going through. And what I'm gonna argue is that looking at the politics of these countries, these small, rather vulnerable countries uh, like Moldova, like Belarus, like Ukraine, actually gives us a really great insight into our own politics, some of the problems and, and problems of our own politics. In fact, I just authored a piece in Foreign Policy magazine that just came out, I think, on Friday, uh, you know, about the Ukrainianization of, of U.S. politics and how I think a lot of you probably noticed that U.S. politics has become increasingly enmeshed with the politics of Ukraine, whereby it seems that that uh, that you know our President Trump, who is a TV star, like. President Zelensky of, um, of Ukraine, and also a populist, um, is really now in a position where, on the one hand, he sort of holds Zelensky's fate in his hand, right, in terms of sending weapons, sending these Javelin missiles, anti-tank missiles to Ukraine. But also the reverse is true in a way that, that Zelensky kind of holds Trump's fate in his hands as well in the sense that Zelensky apparently has the ability to develop, uh, dig up dirt on his rival, or potentially to give witness to uh, some of the things that, that uh, Trump has been accused of in the impeachment hearings that are going on right now. So, um, you know, this enmeshment of politics is reflective of the fact that both of our countries are kind of caught up in the same conflict, and it's having very similar impact on, on both of our countries. So what is at stake? I think for sake of time, I'm gonna focus just on the first point of this slide, which is that, um, that what's really at stake in this conflict, and I, I'm sure everybody's heard about this conflict, right? I'm not, you know, everybody has heard about it. Everybody knows that there's something going on. But what I'm trying to get to is why, are, why is this happening at all? And what are we really fighting about with Russia? Because I believe we are in a conflict with Russia of a certain type. Um, and the, the, the conflict is really basically about the fact that the Western institutions that were created at the end of the Second World War to solidify some type of political space, some type of security space within Europe, the European Union and NATO, 
Uh, Russia decided at a certain point that they are displeased with those institutions and want to basically eliminate those institutions and replace them with a type of great power concord, um, a sort of great power Europe where would, the institutions would be sort of uh, diminished or, or eliminated and essentially uh, uh, it would be replaced by some sort of periodic meetings between the great powers like France, Germany, uh, UK maybe, uh, US, outside of the framework of NATO and outside of the framework of the EU. But it's also true that um, at stake in this conflict are different value systems of liberal versus more traditional values, different types of politics, Democrat versus authoritarian, and um, different economics, market-oriented or state-dominated. Um, but I'm not gonna, just for sake of time today, I wanna get your questions and your responses. So I'm gonna just gloss over that for the moment and focus on the key points. So when I put this map up, I like to explain you know, what I'm talking about with you know, just with visuals and with maps. Partly because I love maps, okay? So I'm, I'm somebody who, from a very young age, used to always stare at maps, and I would sit around thinking about, like, all the different places on the map and what's going on in those places at the current time, right? And after a while of looking at maps, I began to realize that maps tell a story. They, they very much betray the political vision of the map maker. So they tell us a lot about what people are thinking about when they, when they come up with these maps. Now, if I were to ask you what this map is of, I think that a lot of people would say, this is a map of Europe, right? Any other, anybody who would, who would say that it's a map of Europe? I, I hope I'm not too far afield here. It's a map of Europe. To, to Western eyes, this looks like a map of Europe. And you see that a lot of the countries, the European countries are all in this really bright blue, members of the European Union. Some are in a lighter shade of blue. But then there are some gray countries, right? Um, and they're sort of the background of this type of Europe, right, that include Russia. It's even more visible on this map, which is actually an official map of the European Union, um, the European Council. And um, here you have a sort of uh, European celebration of nations, I guess, right? You have all these nations in bright colors, and they all have flags over here, you know? And then behind that map, the sort of background to this map is uh, Russia, right? So you can, if you look at this map, I think through Western eyes, this looks like a normal map of Europe, right? We would not remark on this at all. This would be the type of map you would find in your classroom. But if you take a second and try to look at it through Russian eyes, I think you see a lot worse picture emerging from this map. Right? This looks like a bad map. Right? Because Russia, I think it's important to note, sees itself as a European power, has been a European power, identifies with Europe, sees itself as not only a European power, but one of the biggest European powers. And yet, in the map of contemporary Europe, it's kind of nowhere. My favorite um, map of Europe of all is this map, which shows, I think, you know, what some might call multi-speed Europe or multi-level uh, Europe. This is not an official map. It just comes from some map maker. I had to write to Thailand, actually, to get the permission to use this map in my book. Um, but in any case, um, it is a, uh, a map of a top-tier Europe that corresponds with a kind of Western um, mentality, right, that this is... Uh, that when we talk about Europe and the U.S., these are the countries we mainly are talking about. Then there's a corner of second-tier Europe, of countries that joined the EU in 2004. A third-tier Europe, which here includes Romania, Bulgaria, and Asia. And then a kind of fourth-tier Europe, uh, which includes Russia. Right? Everybody getting my drift here? Right. Europe, Russia does not want to be fourth-tier Europe. Right? That's to put it very, in a nutshell. Okay. So what Russia, how Russia imagines the map of Europe is more like the map of the uh, 19th century imperial period, in which Russia is one of the great powers of the European continent, in fact has an empire in Europe, right, Eastern Europe, um, and is equivalent to, if not greater than in power, to all the other major powers in Europe, the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire at this time, the Ottoman Empire and you know, the Kingdom of Great Britain, France, and Spain. Um, 
And in fact, during that time, Europe, European politics and European security was organized by uh, a set of meetings or a body that was uh, started at the Congress of Vienna. So I don't know how much history everybody learns, European history. Um, it's one of those areas which when you study Eastern Europe, you really got to learn a little bit about. So I've spent a fair amount of time, although I'm not a historian. But I'll tell you that the Congress of Vienna was created at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. People have probably heard of Napoleon, how he conquered half of Europe. At the, at the end of those wars, when Napoleon was finally defeated and sent off to Elba, I guess, he was, um, the, 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 the other European powers got together and said, well, we need to reconstruct some type of security regime in Europe. And they created this Congress of Vienna where all the leaders of the great powers got together and said, we don't want any more wars. Uh, we don't want to tread on each other's uh, uh, feet. So we're going to meet periodically. And if we have a security crisis, we will work out some type of arrangement between ourselves. And the types of security problems they had um, were often about smaller powers in Europe that wanted recognition within the state system. So for instance, if there was a, a rebellion in Poland, as happened in, I think, 1832, right? and say the Russian Empire was having difficulty dealing with it, they could invite the Austro-Hungarian you know, Austro troops, for instance, to help them put it down. If the Italians wanted their own state, and they, could, um, and they were starting to rebel, and the Habsburg monarchy was having difficulties with it, they could invite the Russians in. As happened in 1848, if there's a democratic rebellion, uh, and all these nation states want to be free, uh, they could invite in other powers to help them uh, keep this more conservative uh, great power Europe going. And this is another picture which maybe more of you familiar with uh, at the negotiations at the end of the Second World War in which um, Russia, this is a kind of vision of what great power Europe looks like. It's Russia negotiating with you know, Churchill, Stalin negotiating with Churchill and with Roosevelt over, at Yalta over you know, who gets what sphere of influence in Europe. So, um, so what does Russia want? It wants a bunch of things that are fundamentally opposed to what the West wants right now. Um, to neutralize what it sees as a threat posed by Western institutions uh, and to be treated as a great power. So here's the Putin part. So um, you might ask, well, why did this happen, right? Because, um, actually, let me, let me back up a second. Um, Oops, let me back up a second and just explain something. Because um, there's, a reason why, um, there's a reason why the West does not think that a great power Europe is a great idea. Right? And the reason is pretty simple. It's that from a Western point of view, the Congress of Vienna ultimately failed. It, it failed not only a couple times, but it failed catastrophically in 1848 and then at the start of the First World War when, when it failed to prevent war happening in Europe. And the reason that it failed, that I've sort of intimated, is that the great power concept, it's a great idea that the great powers are all that matter and that, that everybody, they can sort things out within themselves. But Europe is not made up of great powers alone. Europe is actually made up, as you saw from the previous maps, of lots of smaller powers as well as the bigger powers, right? And in fact, both the First World War and the Second World War were sparked by smaller powers challenging um, the situation right, in Europe or giving some pain to the, to the big powers or temptation to the big powers. So the First World War, as you may recall, was, was started when a Serbian anarchist threw a bomb into the carriage of the Archduke Ferdinand of the Habs Habs Habsburg Empire attempting to assassinate him in order to, to generate um, sort of Serbian national independence. Right? That was the goal. And then a variety of these great power alliances sort of clicked into place and everybody started fighting and a with a devastating war in Europe that killed a generation of Brits. And this. The Second World War was, was started over Poland. Right? It was when Germany, the great powers made this agreement, you know, Germany and Russia were going to split up Poland between ourselves, that's what sparked the Second World War. So the, 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 the mutual incomprehension, I think, that exists between Russia and the West today is that the institutions of EU and NATO, which, um, which exist in the West, solve this problem 
to a large extent of representing the great powers, but also representing the small powers. Okay. If you think about NATO, uh, you probably may, may have heard about NATO. It's a big military alliance that the United States is a part of, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And it's run on what's called a sort of all for one, one for all basis, right? If any one country is attacked, all of the countries are obliged to declare war, right, on whoever the attacker is. And if you think about it for a second, you realize that actually that structure is most advantageous to the small states in Europe, right? Because if Estonia is attacked, which you know, couldn't really do anything, honestly, about Russian attack on its own, it gets the full power of NATO, right? If Netherlands is attacked, it gets the full power of NATO behind it. So NATO's structure, although it's very often portrayed as being something that the US dominates and Germany dominates, actually is primarily advantageous for the smaller states. Similarly, in the European Union, which uh, again is very often portrayed in the press as primarily dominated by Germany, which is maybe true to some extent, gives a huge amount of political representation to the smaller states in Europe. Each of them get uh, one of the commissions in part of the cabinet of the European University, Uni 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 Union. Um, each of them is appointed by one of the states, regardless of how small. And also in the voting mechanisms of the European Union, the small states are overrepresented to the extent that the four Visegrad states, which have a population of, I want to say like 25 million, have more votes than Germany, which has a population of 80 million. Right? So these structures, from a European perspective, better serve European security. And Europe tends to look at Russia's um, proposals for a great power structure as being totally backwards. You've often, you've probably heard the term, Russia has this 19th century view of the world. Well, that's what they're talking about, right? The, Russia has this view of this great power world that exists in the 19th century that failed. From the European perspective, it totally failed, catastrophically failed. But from the Russian perspective, it's way better because it doesn't make Russia a fourth tier state. So a lot of what's going on here is, a, is sort of a mutual incomprehension. Why did this happen? So in academic approaches, there are uh, three general sorts of arguments about how the West sort of stumbled into a kind of conflict with Russia. And one of them is the Putin approach, and that's my approach. That's why I put it first there. Um, I know that that may be something that, uh, that my colleague Sam Marcus may, may, may disagree with later. And that's fine, because there are also two other approaches, which are also pretty valid, I think. Um, that emphasized the history of Russia as a state and uh, this idea that Russia was sort of pushed by the West into, uh, into op opposing it. Um, the Putin perspective really says, look, and this is my perspective largely, although I acknowledge my academic colleagues who have different views as being having a lot of reasonable things to say, but I think overall, um, it was Putin who made this decision to switch into opposition mode with the West, and in fact, to attack the West in a certain way. And uh, he did that after a series of more pro-Western governments in, in Russia. The Gorbachev government and the Yeltsin governments were largely friendly with the West. And it seems to have been partly down to his own personality and preferences, right? He just had, he was a, a product of the KGB. He was raised in the Soviet Union. He experiences a big negative fact, the uh, collapse of communism and the fall of the Berlin Wall. And um, is kind of nostalgic, he says, it's a, in some ways to the Soviet Union, although not entirely. And um, well, embraces neo-fascist thinking might be a little extreme, but that's, some people argue that. Um, not so much myself, but I would say that um, he's embraced a kind of extreme or sort of nationalist vision of Russia's place in the world. Um, but there are good arguments, I think, in these other perspectives as well that, um, that have pointed out that if you look throughout the broad reach of, of Russian history, and that was one of the great courses I actually took at, at Harvard in, in like a long time ago with Professor Edward Keenan, who was a really super historian of, of Russia, and he taught a big intro class for freshmen. I think I took that. And you know, his, his argument was that if you go back over Russian history, one of the dominant you know, threads in Russian history is this, is this um, battle between sort of westernizers of Russia and Slavophiles, right? In other words, people who think that 
Russia would modernize and become better and more powerful if it took um, things from the West, such as architecture, know-how, um, you know, and was, you know, tried to have a Western, a Westernizing, modernizing impulse, like Peter the Great or Catherine the Great. And then other czars uh, and emperors who, um, who saw Russia as opposed to the West. And of course, under the Soviet period as well, Russia was, of course, deeply opposed to the West and really dug into this position of, of anti-Westernism. And the idea there is, there are various ideas that make that up. One of them is a union of Slavic peoples. One of them is Orthodox Christianity. Um, but another that's, that's commonly discussed in Russia today is that Russia isn't really fully European in its culture, in its mentality, in its base. And I think it's uh, one, of Russia, one of Putin's propagandists recently wrote a piece saying, Russia is a mixed breed, right? Russia is neither European nor Asian, but has elements of both, and is always misunderstood, you know? Understands everyone, but loved by no one, I think was the phrase he used. Um, the other view pushed by my colleague John Mearsheimer and many others um, uh, is that uh, Russia was sort of backed into op opposing the West, was sort of pushed in a corner when NATO began expanding you know, in, towards Russia, taking in some countries that have been part of the Soviet Union. Um, and interestingly, the, Europe, the West has been very naive about Russia and hasn't really realized that Russia would be uh, backed into a corner in this way. Okay, so um, now I wanna talk a little bit about, how much time do I have, Jerry? Okay, okay, good. So I'm gonna talk about why Russia is so aggressive, and I think this is another piece of the argument that there's a sort of broad mutual incomprehension between Russia and the West right now. Because one of the really odd things about this conflict that we're in is that um, the West believes, I believe, I think most people in this room would believe, that we don't really pose any threat to Russia at all, right? The West poses no threat to Russia. In fact, the European Union was actually granted the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012, okay? Because of its contributions to European peace. The European Union, in many ways, is a peace organization, right? The whole point of the EU from West European or American point of view is to guard the peace by economic interchange, right? Tightening the linkages between economies to the point where they don't have any interest in attacking one another. And we believe that that's worked for 70 years. It's secured European security. And, um, and so the whole notion when you tell Europeans that your threat, the EU threatens Russia, they're like, well, we don't have an army, you know, we don't have any interest or intent in challenging Russia. How in the world, we won the Nobel Peace Prize, right? We just wanna integrate them economically. How in the world could we be a threat to Russia? Right? It's ridiculous, right? Of course, NATO is a slightly different business, but even then, if you look at you know, NATO, you know, you'd have to say that you know, at the end of the Cold War, the United States had over 300,000 troops stationed in Europe, and today it has 30,000 troops. Right, um, and you know, so how that looks like an elevated threat to anybody is is also mystifying, I think, to 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 some extent to military planners. Although it is true that that overall, in all the different armies in Europe, they have more forces than the Russian army has. Um, so um, I think the, the, the point I wanna make is that Russia feels existentially, does feel existentially threatened despite our incomprehension of that. And the reason is that, um, that, that when we say, oh, we support democracy in Europe, that is actually an existential threat potentially to Russia. Putin is not a Democrat, Putin is an autocrat. We can talk for two seconds about the regime that he runs. The regime is a sort of top-down structure that has been very often compared to a mafia organization um, you know, often called a mafia state or a sistema, uh, with a, a, a peak, a pyramidal structure with Putin at the top, and um, giving, you know, an extremely corrupt, giving, you know, sort of uh, gifts all along the way. And so um, this type of system, you know, if you were to, um, to impose democracy or have people who wanted democracy, the first thing you would do is they get rid of Putin, right? 
And of course, that, he doesn't want that to happen. And so democracy is perceived as probably one of the central threats to his regime. I'm, I could go into some of these other arguments. I'm not going to do that so much um, just because of time. But just say that there's a whole lot of other things that the West thinks that it wants to project onto Russia, which Russia sees as against its own interests, at the very least, and possibly a threat to the existence of the type of regime that exists in Russia. So Russia feels ultimately marginalized and insecure in a NATO Europe, and has lashed out. Now, people differ. One of the issues I discuss in the book is, when did Russia decide to lash out? I believe that it happened by 2007. So since 2007, Russia has launched a concerted attempt to undermine uh, Western institutions, Western governments, um, through a variety of techniques that are sort of asymmetric in character. And um, the purpose of these attacks has been to say, look, there's an existential threat emanating from the West. We need to disable these political systems and disable these institutions so that they won't attack us. And the way we're going to do that is disable them from within using uh, information warfare, uh, computer hacking, et cetera. Um, those aspects of it, I think, that everybody's heard about because they, they're talked about incessantly on TV. <laughs> Uh, I'd be very surprised if people haven't heard about that, so I'm not going to go too much into that. But say that, that that's only part of the puzzle here. There's many other techniques that Russia has at its disposal and has been using to, um, to undermine uh, these Western structures. So one of them is financing of um, far-right parties and also far-left parties. So any, most, I would, argue, I would wager, although I don't have full information here, that Russia is probably the biggest financer of fascist parties in Europe and far-right parties, which is sort of weirdly counterintuitive, and probably also far-left parties. Any party that takes an anti-EU, anti-NATO stance, they're probably financing, you're trying to finance to some degree. Um, they are trying to uh, recruit governments within the EU and NATO institutions who will articulate their views within those institutions, causing some chaos in those institutions, and of course getting information out of it. I've been told by EU officials that they feel like Russia hears everything that goes on in the EU, even in the closed councils of the EU. Um, also, there have been, you know, a lot of what Russia is doing, you know, there's some terminological issues. Sh it, should I call this a hybrid war or, you know, so one of my colleagues, so the other thing I was thinking about was political war, right? That's another term that's often used for this because most of these attacks are really fall below the threshold of what you would say is a military attack, right? We don't feel like we're under attack, partly because we aren't under a traditional type of attack. And um, you know, even hacking a presidential election is not something apparently that would generate a military response. Um, and so, um, but at the same time, I chose the hybrid war terminology because in fact, part of this is kinetic. Part of this is about, you know, projectiles hitting somebody else. And uh, there have been targeted assassinations. The, the most uh, well-known case, I think, in the West is the Skripal case. I don't know if you, anybody have heard about that, but where Russia took out a, a former spy in Salisbury in Britain using a, a nerve agent, a, a restricted chemical nerve agent, which was definitely intended, in my view, to send a kind of message to the West of what they were willing to do. Um, there, you may have noticed about a year ago, President Putin announced that he has all sorts of fancy new nuclear weapons that are hypersonic and can basically hit targets in the United States within five minutes or something like that. It can take out New York, take out DC, et cetera. Um, and, um, right. Um, and the approach here is basically to elevate pro Western or anti. I'm uh, sorry, pro-Russian or anti-Western leaders in these states, and ultimately sort of narrow the range of, uh, of, of normal politics, and therefore make, make politics in these, in these institutions and countries more contentious, and therefore deter aggression and deter the ability to aggress against Russia, which they feel is happening. So Russia really believes and says on the TV news every single day. So most Russians, I think, Stan can tell me if I'm wrong about this, really see that you know, every day they're getting this message, the West is out to get us, they're coming to get us. You know? It's like this sort of drumbeat that they have going on there that we never hear about. And um, 
I want to talk a little bit about the Western reactions. So the Western reactions very shortly are that we didn't notice this happening for at least five years after it was happening, <laughs> and really only began to respond after the Ukraine events, after the invasion of Crimea in 2014. And when we did, however, um, we began, it, it, was, it was almost, you know, maybe too little too late, hard to say, but the main uh, way in which the West has struck back at Russia is through economic sanctions, is business school. So um, economic sanctions are kind of an interesting uh, topic of debate, I suppose, um, in various areas. But for the West, I think the reason that we wrote, uh, reached for economic sanctions is because the West is far bigger than Russia in economic size. The size of the Russian economy is actually about the size of Italy's economy. And so when we put sanctions on Russia, they really can't respond in any significant way. And the way, that's why I think that, that they respond through these more asymmetric methods and also through threats of nuclear war, because of course, Russia does have a co-equal nuclear arsenal to the United States. And so they respond with the things that they're good at, we respond to the things where we have predominance in. Um, okay, so the result is that um, is not been good. Um, of this story has not been good. Basically, uh, Russia kind of, in my view, you could take different views on this. And some people say we attack Russia first and they attacked us and the, whatever. You know, but whatever the point is that, um, that the, the, the cycle of responses has not made anybody more secure, but has just led to a, a more and more of a, a standoff between these countries. Um, and I'm going to talk for two minutes if I can, Jerry. Do I have a couple minutes left? Five minutes? I'll talk for five minutes about how it's affected politics in the lands in between. So um, one thing that if you want to really see what this conflict does to countries, the best place to go is these small vulnerable countries that are in between Russia and the European Union, including Ukraine, including Moldova, including some of the Caucasus countries. And um, I argue that these countries have been uh, faced with a sort of paradoxical effect on their politics. On the one hand, as you can imagine, conflict polarizes countries. So people in these countries really have to decide, am I pro-Russian and I want to like go with Russia and I think Russia's doing a good job and we want our country to join, you know, sort of a new Soviet Union kind of 2.0 kind of thing? Or am I pro-European and I want ultimately my country to sort of follow this trajectory of moving towards the West and modernizing and potentially growing much faster in this thing? And there isn't a lot of room in the middle, right? <laughs> because this is a sharp conflict um, and there, then people talk about it sometimes in these countries as a matter of civilizational choice, right? Which is a sort of, in a way, a polarizing discourse. So you have to decide if you're gonna join Eastern civilization or you're gonna join Western civilization. But paradoxically, um, well, let me skip over here. But paradoxically, in these countries, we see that, um, that as politics polariz polarizes at grand level, the people who really rise to power, rise to the top of the system, aren't ideological, don't necessarily have strong preferences about joining Russia or the EU, and simply find ways to profit off of both of these sides, taking positions on both sides of the divide. Why is that profitable? Well, it's profitable because um, you have these two big powers on your borders who both want you to do something different, and they're willing to pay you for it, right? And so axiomatically, I would argue in these countries that the richest and most powerful person usually in these countries is somebody who's managed to convince both sides Right, that they are worth paying off. And I'll just give you two examples of this. Um, one is, and, and these, and by the way, this model goes further than just the lands in between. Increasingly, the same type of pattern is evident in Central Europe, it's evident in Western Europe, and evident in North America, evident in the United States, where you have politicians who try to play both sides. In fact, just to get to the, 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 the US case for a second, I think if you look at the impeachment hearings and the things that are being discussed around the impeachment hearings, one of the really surprising things that is, that is happening right now is that, um, is that President Trump, who's very often been accused of being pro-Russian and being sort of in the pocket of Putin and being, um, being uh, sort, of, uh, sort of devoted to Putin in a sort of way, 
Interestingly, in the conversation that he's going to be getting impeached over with uh, Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine, he's offering, if you think about it, to sell Vladimir Zelensky weapons to fight who? To fight Russia, right? And so the point being that, um, that regardless of what he thinks about Russia and Ukraine, he's willing to take, uh, if, if that person gives him, gives him um, some benefit for his campaign. So in other words, he's not necessarily taking sides between Russia and Ukraine, right? But he's willing to take payoffs from both of these sides to advance his own personal interests. That's what's, that, what I think jumps out to me about the conversation. But I'll give you some other cases because frankly, this argument is a lot easier to stomach and a lot easier to understand when you think about somewhere else, okay? <laughs> Rather than your own country. Um, let me just give you quickly the example of Viktor Orban of Hungary. Viktor Orban is the uh, prime minister of Hungary and he is um, well known for having close links with Russia. Right? He has certain uh, big deals that he's uh, inked with Russia to build a nuclear plant in, in Hungary and to build a, uh, a, a gas pipeline that, that Hungary is going to be a hub of with Russia. And you would think that the European Union of which Hungary is a member, would punish him for that, right? Be like, why are you doing so much business with Russia? You need to do, you know, according to our rules. Um, but in fact, the European Union has been solicitous towards Orban, right? Has been extremely, so if you think about it, his strategy is um, the more he does deals with Russia, the more valuable he becomes to the European Union because the European Union wants to keep him on their side wants to keep Hungary within the European Union, and is therefore willing to do more for Orban in terms of financing, in terms of overlooking all the anti-democratic things that he's done. Right. So that's one type of strategy that people can use in these in-between conflicts, is that, is that weirdly and paradoxically, if you're helping the other side, you don't become less valuable to one side, you actually become more valuable to, to one side. I know this is, I see a lot of stares of incomprehension. Partly this is because we're in the United States and every Sunday, a lot of people sit down in front of their TV sets and they root for their team. Here in South Carolina, I think it's on Saturday, right? The people do that, right? And so when you go, when you watch the Gamecocks on TV, right? Or you go to the stadium, how many people are rooting for both sides? Tell me. In this country, that is not our culture. <laughs> Generally speaking, when I'm watching TV with people, they're rooting for one side, one team. We're supporters of one team, right? We don't support both teams. What I'm telling you about is politicians who are on both sides, right, of these issues. And that becomes very hard to understand. I'll just give you one more example. This is a guy, Vladimir Plotnik, until recently he was, uh, well, he's the biggest oligarch in the uh, country of Moldova. And he had a different strategy. His strategy was really interesting. He set himself up as the leader of the biggest pro-EU party in Moldova, right? trying to move Moldova in a more Western direction. However, his background was kind of criminal, basically. He was, he probably, he was sort of a mob boss, basically. He probably got his, uh, his start and made his fortune in some very bad businesses, including human trafficking. Um, and um, he realized that the EU, who he wanted their contracts and their money coming into his country, probably they were only going to support him if they thought that it was a dire situation in Moldova and Moldova was about to get overrun by Russians, right? And so cleverly, he not only created the first, the biggest like democratic EU party in, in Moldova, but he also financed the biggest pro-Russia party in Moldova, right? Under the theory that that would create a kind of threat situation that would encourage the West to finance him. And it worked for quite a long time. He was also, by the way, um, my favorite little factoid about him is his, one of his legit businesses is TV. And all the time that he was running the biggest pro-EU party in Moldova, he also owned the two biggest TV stations that rebroadcast Russian TV and all of Russian TV propaganda right? that is anti-Western, right? making money you know, just literally off of both sides. Of course, the strategy isn't always perfect. It can be a little dangerous, as you can imagine. And Plodnyuk was ejected after the last election, is now in exile where in Miami. Okay. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to end and just say I got to the sort of you know payoff point. Um, 
you know, that um, we can laugh and we can look at these countries in between as being sort of these odd, you know, sort of places. But actually, they have a lot of lessons for what's happening in the West today. Uh, and I tried to spell a couple of them out um, really briefly. And I look forward to my, the commentators, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, and, and Mitchell, thanks so much for being here with us. I, I found this a stimulating discussion. And I must say I, I agree with you on all of it. So I, I, I won't try to challenge you on anything, but I would like to kind of highlight a few things um, that I think are really fascinating about what you've said. And one is how we understand the current situation and, and Russian motives in this. And I'm not going to speak with any great depth of knowledge on this, but just an impression. I think the biggest challenge in understanding what it is that Russia is after is that it's not clear that there's any sort of vision behind it. The only thing that I can see, and, and I think your talk echoes this, pointing to um, the Congress of Vienna as kind of the model of when things, things were nice for Russia, is exactly the problem that Vladimir Putin, Putin faces right now. because. Because it's easy to say that's not relevant to the 21st century. And if you ask, what is the, the image of Russia's power in the world that's relevant to the 21st century, it's kind of hard to find that somewhere. So we're faced with a situation where since the end of the Cold War, um, if the Cold War was a, a period of conflict that was defined by different ideas about the way the world should be ordered, and then if we take Francis Fukuyama's argument, one of them disappeared leading to an end of history with nobody here but us liberal Democrats, the alternative doesn't exist anymore. And so in Vladimir Putin's vision of Russia as an alternative to the West, without articulating a, a, an alternative vision, what he's really left with is fighting against something he doesn't like. And so the best strategy and tactics for this is to foster chaos among those things he doesn't like. But it's not a very good motive or strategy for creating an alternative future. And I find that to be kind of a troubling situation that we're in right now. I don't have an answer for it. But I think it is one of the big, one of the big challenges. I also, as, as somebody who studies Western European politics, my remarks would not be complete without some reference to Brexit. Right? <laughs> so in some ways, it, what you're describing, Putin's situation is very much like the English Brexiteer, the person who wants to leave the European Union. And if you think back to the referendum that was cast, the big defining problem with the referendum was that it laid out one specific choice that was kind of not very specific. It asked people, do you want A or not A? All right? Do you want to stay in the European Union or do you want something else? And the something else wasn't defined. So the British have spent the last three years trying to figure out what not A means. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, Vladimir Putin has spent the last six, eight years telling us, I don't want A. But he hasn't provided a vision for what not A is. And so the, the strategies are then to sow, sow chaos and, and foster um, mm -hmm. unrest. Um, it, now I'm going to make just a very brief remark about something that, that did strike me directly by your talk that I hadn't thought about before. And that is, in the absence of vision as something that drives political action, what we're left with is really a transactional politics. Mm -hmm. That people are in it not to pursue any goal or objectives, but simply to obtain an advantage on specific issues and points at various uh, points in time. And even, even worse, if you want to be cynical about it, they don't have to have any l underlying set of moral concerns to guide them from one choice to the next. They simply get to the next point, um, wherever that point is, and then make the best for themselves at the next step after that. It's not a very positive and rosy vision of the future, but I think it does outline kind of the big challenge. And that brings us, I think, in many ways back to, to your, your, your comparisons to where we are in the United States today. The biggest challenge is that there's this great disenchantment with the world we thought we understood we're not quite sure 
exactly what alternative we want. And, and, and that leads to a lot of unrest without movement. And that's perhaps what's most frustrating about politics in many countries today. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and also to organizers for allowing me to comment very briefly. Now, as a Russian, I can't help but notice that in one week we have an anniversary of the Soviet uh, October Revolution. My great-grandfather was one of the revolutionaries on the barricades of St. Petersburg making it happen. So now that we have established that I'm a sleeper agent, uh, <laughs> let me... Let me offer a few remarks. Um, do you guys know the Russian doll, Matryoshka, like the several layers? So to me, the beauty of Mitchell's book, which I really enjoyed, is that it's very much like a Matryoshka, right? Mitchell presents us with this outer geopolitical layer. Inside, we have the polarized domestic politics of civilizational choice. And at the very core, we have these flexible power brokers. That's wonderful. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to add a few layers to this doll, right, so that hopefully we have a fun discussion afterwards. I would like to start with Russian propaganda and what to do about it. Uh, so I just picked several random things that I find interesting. So we can divide Russian propaganda into two parts, right? One part that is outright lies and myths, and it's very easy to know what to do with that. You debunk, you block, you preempt, you expose, you shame. My real question is what to do with the parts of Russian propaganda that are kind of true and that are basically critiques of Western policy that freely strike at some valid points. What to do about that? To give you a few quick examples. Let's take, let's say, uh, the US invasion of Iraq, all right? And just to give you some context, after 9-11, in the hours after the towers fell, Putin was the first world leader to call George Bush. And in a 40-minute conversation, he offered Russia's unconditional support. In the days to come, Putin went on television and offered the United States Russian airspace, as well as the possibility to station American troops in Central Asia. At the time, McFall, Mike McFall, whom I really respect, he went on to become US ambassador under Obama in Russia. And he's also a very fierce critic of Putin, but at the time, this is how he commented on Russia allowing basically American troops very close to its home. It's as if America allowed Russian troops in Mexico. So this was a very pretty big deal, right? So what happens later? Later the US on basically trumped up charges of WMDs and um, Al Qaeda links invades Iraq, right? And against Russia's advice and also against the UN Security Council resolution. So what the signal that sent to Putin was basically that the U.S. is not interested in an equal partnership and the U.S. is not really interested in a rule-based world order. Now, regarding the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, Russia was on board with that. It saw the rationale, but it advised America against a long-term stationing of troops. It basically pointed to its own Soviet experience just 30 years prior and said, look, guys, you can do this, but if you stay, you will pull out in defeat. And we can offer you all the Soviet intelligence on Afghanistan that we have if you want. We want to help you. The US ignored both the Soviet intelligence or the Russian intelligence and went in to station troops long term. So from the Russian perspective, and Russia doesn't do it just to help America, of course, right? Russia cares about its security interests in its backyard. To America, problems in Iraq and Afghanistan are very much problems that destabilize Russian borders, right? So Russia had its own citizens going to Iraq and basically becoming jihadists and coming home. Afghanistan is number one tra drug trafficker through the Russian territory, right? So to Russians, it's kind of America creates this mess and then leaves Russia to deal with it, right? So that's one just out of many examples that one can mention of this Russian criticism that's definitely used for propaganda purposes, but can also not be simply brushed aside as something made up, right? A second example takes us back further in history. Uh, namely, it's about the interpretation of World War II. In 2009, 70 years since, the, since Hitler's invasion of Poland in 1939, 
Putin published an article in Gazeta Wyborcza, a Polish newspaper, and that article was called A Letter to the Poles. The article was very conciliatory. It basically said, look, both Soviet and Polish populations were victims of two tyrants, right? But Putin pushed back against the Western interpretation of the Hitler-Stalin pact as the trigger for World War II. Hitler-Stalin pact, I don't want to kind of go through history, but basically Stalin and Hitler agreed not to attack each other, and they also divided Eastern Europe between the, themselves, right? Putin said, like, look, what happened one year before this pact? Western powers side, signed the Munich Agreement with Hitler, where they basically accepted Hitler's aggression up to that point and then took him on his word to not keep on going. What did that leave the Soviets with? It basically told them there was no hope for a united front against fascism, and it exposed them to the prospect of facing the Nazi war machine alone. Right? So again, this is just as an example of how Russians think, that some of their points are valid, and that they also present us with a challenge. What do we do with these critiques? Do we address them, implicitly acknowledging Russia as a valid debate partner? Do we ignore these critiques and just basically tell Russia that, look, you can ignore our critiques too, right? Because that's how we deal when you raise valid points. So that's one thing. Um, do I have time? Oh, two minutes, okay. Okay, I will go quickly through uh, some things explaining Russia's uh, aggressive behavior. So let me mention two alternative theories, right? So we saw three theories listed by Mitchell before. I'll give you two others. One of them is very simple. Look at oil prices. That's all you need to know about when Russia is going to behave aggressively versus not. So in political science, there is this very interesting paper that basically says, look, you shouldn't interpret Russia as a revengeful declining superpower you should look at it as a very typical petrostate. Petrostate means that basically the country runs on oil and gas. It really depends on the revenues. And that paper looked at 153 countries, right? Very robust analysis over 50 years. And it basically shows when the oil prices hit the peaks, petrostates become very aggressive towards their neighbors. Conversely, uh, the non-petrostates, there is no variation. Furthermore, when the oil prices are really low, Petrostates are much more peaceful towards their neighbors when not, than non-petrostates. So to give you very briefly the timeline, so 2001, 2002, oil prices at 20, 25 dollars per barrel. Putin is a big friend of the United States. In 2001, Putin mentioned specific steps that Russia will take to join single economic zone with Europe, right? 13 years later, 2014, oil prices over 110%. Putin punishes Ukraine for doing the very, f the very thing that he said Russia would do, right? I can give you many more points, right? So basically, 2007, the Munich speech, this is the first oil price hike in Russia at $75. Um, and so the bottom line here, look at the oil prices. So today, just FYI, it's $61 per barrel. So basically, the geopolitical weather around Russia is cloudy, but no thunderstorms. And, okay, one last point, and then I'm going to shut up. So this last point is about domestic politics in Russia as a great way to look at Russia's foreign behavior. Right? So now we have economic explanation, oil prices. We have a foreign explanation, NATO expansion. We have some sort of Russian identity, neo-imperialism, or Putin being a bad guy. Right? All of these are potential explanations. We're adding a fifth one, Russia's domestic policy and the fact that Putin is obsessed with his popularity ratings. Putin is not a Democrat, but he's a smart authoritarian. He knows that running a country is much easier when people like you, because violent repression is very costly and it's unpredictable. Putin checks his ratings sometimes several times a day, okay? Now, what happened just before the Ukrainian invasion? His popularity rankings were at an all-time low since 2000, a 10-point drop within just two years. So this is for Putin, this is the mental equivalent of impeachment proceedings, right? What happened after Russia's annexation of Crimea? They, his popularity rankings shoot up to 86% and stay there for years, despite or perhaps thanks to Western sanctions, right? So here's yet another lens or prism to think about Russia, right? So that we're not stuck in a certain track when we approach these problems. 
So let me stop at this point and hopefully you have a lot of questions for Mitchell. Thank you. Do you want me to recognize people? I think I'll just recognize people if it's okay. okay. Well, we just yeah. I'll send the question around. The yeah, these are great comments. I don't. Uh, so we'll we'll start taking some questions. Yeah, you can I'll just raise your hand and we'll try to get you a mic. So, I know you have questions. First. There's a young lady over here. Yeah. Says, yes. I can't see. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, keep your hand up. So. I'll do my best to get through this. I see a, a young man in the back there as well. Thank you. Okay, yeah. So looking at the distrust of civil societies in post-Soviet states like Moldova and Ukraine, how do you feel like the use of rewards by the West and Russia impact people's perceptions of civil societies in these countries specifically? Hmm. Okay, yeah, another question? Do you sure. Write that down? My question is what about China? It's, it sounds to me like it's the civilization wars between China and the U.S. and Russia is the one in the middle, and where does it all play out? Yeah, great. And then maybe this guy over here, and then we'll take a try and respond. Um, how do you think is the conflict between Russia and the West going to develop in the future? So is it becoming hotter, and um, is there going to be a military conflict, or is it going to cool down, and they will negotiate some sort yeah. of peace treaty? Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll I'll take these kind of in reverse order. Okay. So. On, on that point, I'd have to say that, of course, we don't know what's going to happen. But it does appear to me that things are getting hotter, right? So we're, we're reaching an ever more critical stage, right, in this conflict, right? Where if you think about it, I think that the attack on the 2016 election, that was a very aggressive act, right? Um, that was bound to cause a lot of controversy and has caused a lot of controversy and may have had some big benefits for Russia, but also had some big blowback, you know, from Russia and that a lot of people don't like Russia anymore, right? and feel attacked. Um, where it's going though, I, I'm pretty hopeful that it's not going to end in some sort of military, direct military confrontation. In fact, Russian and US militaries have had um, small incidents, uh, incidents that happened, for instance, in Syria, where uh, a group of Russian mercenaries attacked a US base and were killed uh, in the hundreds um, about a year or two ago. Um, but I think that both sides, you didn't probably, half the people in this room haven't even heard about that because both of the sides didn't want to escalate that. Because I think it's still mutually assured destruction, right? Both sides are pretty conscious of the fact that if we get in some sort of direct armed struggle with Russia, it's not going to end well for anybody. So that's why this war is being fought out in the way that I suggested, with on the one hand these asymmetric sort of undermining techniques on the other side, one side, and the sort of economic sanctions on the other side. And I expect that to continue, I suppose. The, um, the China, um, but I do also think that it's a battle to the death to some extent, right? In other words, that it's going to end when either Putin leaves or when the Western institutions, in fact, are destroyed. <laughs> right? So it's not, it doesn't make it a less serious conflict, but I just don't expect it to accelerate in a sort of military way. Um, about China, so there's a lot of talk about Chinese influence in Europe. And to some extent, China does have growing influence in Europe, um, but it doesn't seem to really have a, a major security impact at the current time. It's not a defining power for security uh, pr presently. So just as, for instance, um, Belarus, uh, which is another of the countries in between, it's more tilted towards Russia, but uh, has recently had more favorable relations with the, with the West. They tried for a while to use China as a counterbalance to, um, to Russia, and they just found that China wasn't really able to provide much of, of use to them at the end of the day. And they, they, it, may be, it may grow in importance at some point in time, but it doesn't seem to be, China doesn't have direct interests that, that it's really willing to fund to that level, I think, at the, at the, mo the current moment. But of course, everybody's watching that, and it could happen. <laughs> um, in terms of the civil society in Eastern Europe, um, generally speaking, um, the West supported a lot of civil society organizations in these countries, thinking that it would lead to democratization. And generally speaking, those organizations tend to be on the pro-Western, pro-EU side of things. However, Russia, when, you know, when this whole thing started, also began supporting certain you know, uh, organizations, et cetera. I don't think they're 
uh, as great in size and as funding, but, but also tried to have you know, sort of soft influence in these countries. Um, but they've acted more through the Orthodox Church and, um, and through other, other types of bodies. Um, but I think your question was whether they're going to develop. I mean, I think, I think uh, they, they probably tend to see themselves as being more pro-Western and more advantaged by if their countries become more pro-Western, they have democracy and they have more space to operate. Although it, maybe they have less funding. So they, again, the funding that we give to them is probably contingent on this threat, you know, so they could, they could play, that, play that out too if they wanted to, I suppose. Um, Maybe I'll just respond a, a little bit to the comments. I mean, first of all, I, I, Bob, Bob said at the beginning that a lot of his comments, like he, he liked everything I, I said, and, and, and I was very complimented, of course, by that. And, but I didn't really believe it, Bob, I have to say. Um, but, uh, but then when I heard what he had to say, I actually agreed with everything he said, too. So now I've, now I've decided we have a meeting of the minds, you know, and that maybe we're like an old married couple. We can finish each other's sentences or something. Um, but, you know, um, you know, I think I think it is critical that you know what he said was really true. Um, that you know, Putin sort of has a vision thing problem, right? That um, that we can see Putin is very effective, perhaps in the way that he's rolled out this strategy, but you could also see that it's a little bit lacking in in what's the point, right? That's part of the problem of understanding what Russia is trying to do is that there doesn't seem to be any grand design. As far as I can see, the grand design, such as it is is kind of derivative. It's Soviet Union 2.0, or Soviet light. You know? So you have, on the one hand, this anti-Western militarization, propaganda domestically to make everybody afraid of the rest of the world, um, you know, this kind of uh, increasingly state-based economy, not quite, not quite the same as the Soviet Union in various ways. Um, but you know, the Soviet Union may or may not have been that successful model, really, for Russia. right? And it's not clear that, that the Soviet light model is either going to be very successful. So I, I do think, now, some will say that Putin has tried to articulate this nationalist, Eurasianist sort of policy and maybe moving in a quasi-fascist direction. I'm a little skeptical of that, too. But you know, that seems to be coming up in place of a sort of ideology. Uh, and I guess we're going to see if that's motivating or not. But, you know, maybe on a more positive note, you could say that a lot of countries in this world are moving in a more nationalistic direction, and to some extent, Russia is, you know, at the forefront of that. So, we shall see. Um, I really liked um, Stan's comments as well. Um, they kind of pushed this in certain directions. Um, you know, I had different explanations of why Russia was so aggressive and or why um, why this had all happened, why the conflict started, and you added a couple. There are very reasonable additions to this that oil prices may have determined all of this, and that um, domestic politics, you know, the need of Putin to gain popularity drives a lot of his foreign policy behavior, um, and those are those are absolutely you know reasonable reasonable points to um, that maybe I would subsume under the category of like you know Russia's deep state you know <laughs> sort of behavior or something but you know, can be broken out in that way. Um, and I, th I thought also it was interesting that you had a lot to say about um, Russian propaganda and you know, the fact that Russia may be making some reasonable points. I, I hope that I got through in this talk today that I don't think that Russia is totally unreasonable in the way it thinks about what's going on. Right? Although I didn't come off, obviously, as being very sympathetic to Russia. I tried to present at the beginning that Russia, you know, the way things look, they, they have a lot of reason to be unhappy Right, with the state of affairs in the West, of course with NATO expansion, of course with the way these maps look. I mean, that was the point of that part of the presentation is that if you looked at these maps from a Russian perspective, you could be legitimately concerned. And I do think that it's a big problem in this conflict, as I tried to say, that we totally don't get what they are thinking at all. right? And they totally don't get what we're thinking. We don't understand their history. They don't understand our history. We don't understand their international relations culture. They don't understand our international relations culture. And what we have is in, in international relations, I think some of you are in an international relations class, is what's called in IR theory a security dilemma. right? That one side's reasonable precautions against getting attacked or the other side's aggression and vice versa. right? It's sort of like you know, gangs in a neighborhood. If they, one of them brings a, a gun to a fight, the next time the other one's going to bring a rifle, you know, and the next time the other one's going to bring a bazooka and on, you know, so on and so forth. Right? So, um, 
so I do, I do think that we shouldn't discount, you were right to remind that, you know, a lot of this is BS, right? I mean, a lot of the Russian perspective is outrageous and unreasonable and sounds it. But they do make some good points, right? And they do have their own perspective, moreover, that, you know, is an issue, right? And it is somewhat true. All the perspectives, I agree, in academia make sense, right? And so there is some extent to which this is mutual incomprehension that's led to this. However, I would still put as the center of this, the kind of Putin process that led to this kind of um, split from the West in about 2007. So let's take a few more. Starting over there, I'm a big like right clockwise type of person. So, okay, you go, like go first. Three and then <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, looking at the fact that, especially when you spoke about the Russian perspective of how well, when, when I was reading the foreign policy of uh, basically the previous president, he talked about at one point, he was actually really honest, and he said the fact that any American would think that Ukraine isn't on the sphere of Russian influence is totally ludicrous. But we don't have like a um, basically a pan-American EU like the way Rus the way we have in Europe. Mm -hmm. So let's say if Ru if Russia basically um, has some kind of organization like the EU in South America, where um, uh, Mexico mm -hmm. is basically in that sphere, wouldn't we act the same way? You yeah. Know? Like, like you said, we're not understanding each other. So if there was like a Russian EU where Mexico was included, uh, Mexico wanted to join that, would mm -hmm. we have to invade Mexico? Because wouldn't that be a mm -hmm. definitely a threat, uh, definitely a legitimate threat to our security? So yeah. I wanted, wanted you to like elaborate more on that. Sure, sure. Yeah. That's Did a good question. Like Yeah. And the other thing is, to me, it seems very oversimple that Putin wants it all. He's the richest man in the world, so he wants everything. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Okay, yeah, thank you. Hi, um, I was curious about what you thought, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, what happened on the Kerch Strait yeah. in um, mm -hmm. November 2018. Mm -hmm. I wrote a paper on it and I like, theorized like the timing, if it was like, if the, you know, we were busy with midterms and Brexit was happening and kind of maybe they could just get it in kind of like without anyone noticing. Um, mm -hmm. Just what you kind of thought about that whole skirmish. Yeah, great. Should do one more, yeah. yeah one more. All right, so um, two questions. The first is just to better understand your worldview. I'm not sure why you think the mm -hmm. Um, current liberal order has been more successful than the Council of Vienna. Mm -hmm. uh, Council of Vienna lasted for 100 years, the current liberal order only for 70. The mm -hmm. great seismic shift that the Council of Vienna had to endure was the formation of Germany when the playing board became a player. That increased tensions. The great seismic mm -hmm. shift for the liberal order was the collapse of the Soviet Union that decreased tensions. Mm -hmm. um, they definitely, the Council of Vienna and the states there survived, not a single state fell in the um, revolution of uh, 48. Uh, they seem to have handled that better, I would say, uh, maybe, than uh, we've handled the uh, EU crisis and the uh, mm -hmm. uh, economic crisis of uh, the Great Recession. And so I'm not convinced. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems to be a little bit of Fukuyama talking. <laughs> um, okay. But my, uh, my question uh, regarding uh, Russia is, You've defined this as existential, mm -hmm. which then you defined as Putin leaving. So I, I'm, I'm curious about that. Like existential crisis aren't about leaders; they're about states. Unless mm -hmm. what you, unless you're going to make a uh, neo-realist realist argument of that leaders define their states, which is kind of your argument. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I can see that. But um, is this existential, or mm -hmm. is there a policy program? As somebody mentioned, China. Um, Seems to me there's a lot of uh, bartering capability yeah. uh, for they get a sliver of Eastern Europe or maybe none of Eastern Europe and get concessions on the other border. Great. Yeah, those are all great questions. So let me start, take them in order. So on, you know, the first question is, is Ukraine actually in Russia's sphere of influence? And how would the West react, the United States in specific, react if Russia, you know, formed an alliance with a country that was on our border? Essentially, and the answer is really obvious to that question. It's like, we—you've heard, I'm sure, of the Monroe Doctrine, 
right? Monroe Doctrine, as far as I can see, is still in effect, right? Yeah, and there's no question that the United States would never be happy, right, if, if Russia did such a thing. However, um, Russia has, in fact, um, supported the Venezuela government, Maduro government presently. Have we gone to war there? Not really, you know. So, um, you know, I think, I think when, you, when you look at these things, you know, there's general principles and then there's like actual realities, right? The, the issue with Ukraine, the actual reality around Ukraine is that Ukraine isn't really ours to give, right? We can't, um, we can't just give Ukraine away, right? And the reason for that is because Ukraine itself, since they were invaded, has come around to the view that a majority of Ukrainian voters uh, in, have a durable support for joining the EU and, and now, of course, see Russia as a threat. Right? So even my, my view is that even if we were to trade Ukraine in some respect, as you were suggesting, um, it wouldn't be a stable security arrangement because you have a majority of Ukrainians who don't feel that they want to be traded. And they're not about to let themselves be traded. Right? And what you would have is a long-term guerrilla conflict, basically, on your hands, like in the middle of Europe, right? And so, you know, that being the real situation, I hope that's not over-dramatizing, maybe, <laughs> maybe Stan will say, but, um, but I just think that that's, that's the bit of the problem right now. It's like the problem with great powers, and this goes to this, this critique I was making, is great powers can think they have things under control. But things were only under control in 1848 because they you know, killed all these people and destroyed their national aspirations, which then kept coming up again and eventually overturned the European order. Right? So the thing is, to get a stable security arrangement, you really need to uh, pay attention to the interests of the smaller states as well as the larger states. And I think that's why the, the current order does a lot better job of that than, the, um, than this strategy ever did, the, um, than the great power strategy ever did. Um, so about Putin and Trump, I mean, I think that that's the big thing waiting to happen is like, it would be amazing to know exactly what the Putin-Trump relationship is made of, right? Um, I think it would be a fascinating book to write. I don't know if I'd be the one to write it, but um, I wish I were. Um, I wish I knew. But I think, you know, I think in my mind, I think that you said it's pretty simple. I mean, I think if you use Occam's razor, which is a tool that I sometimes deploy you know, in social science, so do you know about this? It's the idea that the simplest explanation is often the right one. <laughs> um, I would say that, that very simply, Putin, as we know in the public record, um, offered Trump a lot of help with the 2016 election campaign. Whether or not Trump, you know, Trump definitely accepted it, whether or not he agreed you know, previously to this or just sort of sat by while it all happened, you know, is, you know, sort of immaterial, essentially. Maybe we'll never know about that. But for sure, he offered him help, and, and Trump was happy to get this help, right? Just as he was happy to get help from Ukraine, if they were to offer, you know, dirt on the Bidens or whatever it is, you know, or CrowdStrike server, if it even exists, you know, in Ukraine. And um, just as also, I believe, you know, that, that Trump, for his part, you know, also probably accepted support from other foreign powers uh, during that election. I mean, we've seen Saudi Arabia, kind of mysterious relationship there and other places, right? So, so the way I would read it is, you know, there, it's just a, a business transaction. It's like another transaction. It's just like, you help me, great, I'll try to help you. In, probably in that relationship, Trump hasn't helped. I, I don't believe Trump really helped Putin as much as he promised or thought he, or thought he would. I think that probably from Putin's perspective, Trump is a bad debtor um, because he expected, as far as we know from the conversations with Michael Flynn, the Russians really wanted the U.S. to drop sanctions. And whether or not of his own accord, the U.S. didn't drop sanctions, actually. And so I think he, um, he's probably not happy overall with what he got out of the bargain, you know. So you could say Trump won in that, you know, maybe <laughs> in that respect. Um, and this vision of Putin is like, I want to say, like Dr. No, right? <laughs> you know, the kind of evil villain is going to take over the world. You know, that's certainly plausible, you know, possible. But, you know, Dr. No never wins, right? You know, in the James Bond movies, right? Because in a way, unbounded ambitions right, like that are often really hard to fulfill. <laughs> So I think he, I, I would see him as taking a little bit more limited approach. Like a lot of people who, who think that Russia isn't that much of a threat will say, well, look at what wars he's actually fought, right? He's fought like to get little pieces of territories of neighboring states 
that aren't going to offer much opposition. Right? And so maybe he's just doing that for now. And maybe eventually, of course, everybody would like to take over the world you know, on some level. But you know, the, realistically, I don't know if we can anticipate that. But you know, certainly, it's, it's possible. I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt it. The, um, the Kirch Strait issue. So you're right. I think you're, I'd like to read your paper. I'm sure you got your paper right. It sounded like it, you know, that the Kirch Strait uh, was an issue where, um, where, uh, the, um, where Russia sort of sealed off this important, um, this important strait. You can actually see it on this map here, uh, right there. Okay. And it sealed off this shipping lane, which is vital to this part of eastern Ukraine for their international trade. And um, they did it at a time when nobody was paying attention. There wasn't really much of a reaction. Um, and it was, it was one of those things that was like a dropped ball. And it, this did, by the way, happen under the Trump administration. So Trump apparently didn't have, see any um, particular need to react to, to what Russia did uh, there. So I don't know exactly how you'd read it, but definitely that seemed like a further territorial uh, attack, you know, of Russia on Ukraine, or you know, a bid for control, and it seems to have till now worked. Um, so the um, the worldview issue question, I'll try and answer really quickly. So, um, you know, I answered part of it, which is to say that um, that for Europeans and most people in the West, you make some good case for like, you know, oh yeah, the Congress of Vienna was awesome and it did a great job and it lasted for a hundred years. Um, and it, but but I would just point out that that from Western ears, when we hear that, we think of like the last, the total catastrophic collapse of that in the Great War, right? And so you know I don't think that you can argue to Westerners, right? Largely speaking, right? That this was a great success, right? Because first of all, the 1848 period was, was a suppression, a joint suppression of democratic movements with which most Europeans are largely sympathetic and were the birthing of most of the nations in Europe. And, the, um, and, and then 1918 was a catastrophic failure. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, that's just my sense of how people think about these things. They, they, if you say, oh, we should go back to this model where the great powers alone are in charge. First of all, all the small powers in Europe don't want to hear it. You know, second of all, it wasn't that stable. Third of all, it wasn't really compatible with nationalism and nation states. Um, so I just don't see it as being, so I, this is why I think that a lot of Russia's proposals, which, which they thought were reasonable, by the way, um, for how to reorganize European security, were met with like a blank stare, essentially, in the West. They would say, oh, we need to have this organization like the OSCE get rid of NATO and have an OSCE type organization. The West is like, what in the world are you talking about? And, and so that's a bit of the problem, I guess I would say. But we should move on to some other questions. Let's, we can talk let's more do a about couple of later. quick questions and then your response. So here we go. Here's one right. Yeah, and then we'll get that gentleman. Uh, so I'm just curious um, when you look at countries such as Poland or Hungary, which in yeah. recent years have seen a rise of the liberal forces in them, mm -hmm. um, despite the fact that they are EU states, they've been using each other to basically prop each other up. Mm -hmm. in, um, so they don't get kicked out of the EU, they still get to reap the benefits. Do you see that spreading to other countries? And do you think that Russia has had a hand in this because these are countries that have seen influence from Russia in the past? Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. Um, so you mentioned the lands in between Russia and the West, specifically mm -hmm. in Eastern Europe. Um, what would you say in the context of um, the lands in between, between the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China, Mm -hmm. um, we see more Chinese uh, encroachment in Central Asia, which of course is the Federation's backyard. Um, and with keeping that in mind, do you think there would be a benefit to Russia to adopt more of a Western focus and maybe create a new mm -hmm. power balance there? Because uh, currently right now, Putin and Xi Jinping are quite amiable. Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe a, an Alexei Navalny could potentially do that. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Sorry, just to clarify, so what should Russia do, you're saying? Or yeah, what well, what do you foresee the potential for Russian foreign policy in the future? Okay. Keeping in mind, you know, Chinese mm -hmm. encroachment upon, you know, okay. their yeah. backyard. Uh, my question is more about uh, Putin, the future of Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, since coming to power, he's, you explained, like, the top-down pyramid structure. 
I mean, he's done a lot to consolidate his power and rule. It's like when, you know, like kind of seems like it's everlasting for now, but, you know, eventually he's either going to get kicked out or die. Mm -hmm. But where do you see the future of Russia after Putin leaves? Is mm -hmm. someone else just going to move into his spot and take control? Or do you think there's hope for democratic future change? Basically, do, like, uh, what's next when he's gone? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yep. I'm not sure you should have handed me the microphone, Bob, because I was going to say I really enjoyed the comments, but I disagreed wholeheartedly with Bob's comment about there was no vision for Putin and that he offered no alternative. I think even the idea of economic nationalism is an alternative to the liberal order. I think nationalism and the idea of moving towards territorial conquest and acquiring states and territories by force rather than going to negotiation and peaceful means is in fact an alternative. A strong state, state control over resource, all of those things that China would sign on for, these are all the visions that he's projecting and we see those taking hold throughout the world and people supporting them. So even mentioning Fukuyama as having any credibility, I think that his world, has, we have been seeing it um, deteriorating. So Mersheimer, mm -hmm. I would agree with a lot of what he said. And just if we look at what's happening, what the liberal world order was supposed to project with globalization and erosion of boundaries between states, we now have it acceptable that there are tariffs, there's economic nationalism, there's force as a means of resolving conflict, all of those things. So anyway. Uh, yeah. Okay, and then, yeah, so how much time do we have? Zero? Okay. <laughs> All right. So really quickly, um, about Poland and Hungary, <clears throat> you know, there is, there is a rise, as you know, there's a good question, there is a rise of illiberal forces. Um, is it spreading? Um, you know, not as quickly as you might think. Um, so in, uh, the way I read Central Europe right now, and in fact, all of Europe, and in fact, all of the West right now, is that there certainly has been gains with this illiberal sort of, you know, sort of uh, framework, you know, and model. But not everybody agrees with it. It's not like there's massive support for it. And there's quite a lot of pushback against it, right? And you see, in fact, now in a lot of different countries around the world, big pushback also against authoritarian regimes. In Hong Kong, I was discussing with a professor here earlier. So the way I perceive what's going on in the world right now is that there is a new model. It's kind of rising. There are some problems with it. It doesn't really answer all the questions we have, and some people really don't like it. And, um, and the liberal forces are arrayed pretty strongly against it and are winning elections in a lot of places. Um, winning elections in, um, for instance, Romania. Uh, winning elections in Hungary, the mayor's office, you know, turned over in Budapest. Um, uh, various places, you know. So what you see, it seems to me we're in an impasse again. That's kind of the model I would have is that, that there's good arguments, there's, there's, there's problems and liabilities on both sides, you know. But it's, it's, that's the battle we're going to live with, I think, for the next decade. When you go out into the job market, you know, that, that battle will still be going on, you know. And that'll be the, the question of what sides to choose in this is, you know, being made periodically at each election. Right, again, civilizational choice being made at each election in all the Western countries. Um, as far as Central Asia, they, you know, it's interesting. I actually just talked to a group, a Rumsfeld Foundation group uh, that came to Penn, who turned out to come all from Central Asia. And they asked me the same question. They were like, how come you didn't extend this model to Central Asia? Because it totally makes sense for Central Asia. I mean, I said to them, you know, that well, it's a little complicated because of China, right? Because China is, you know, much more present in Central Asia than, you know, as uh, was asked before. They're a dominant sort of power in Central Asia, and usually Central Asian powers kind of try to balance Russia against China, and also bring in the West as a kind of counterbalance against all of them, you know. But I think a lot of the same dynamics probably are visible there. In terms of what Russia's strategy is, I mean, Russia wants to have close relations with the Central Asian states and uh, wants them to know closer relations and wants them to know that it matters. They're in a struggle right now with the president of Kazakhstan to determine his succession strategy and to make sure that, um, that whoever, that actually they might further integrate Kazakhstan into kind of a Eurasian Union once the president goes if they don't find a strong enough leader who's trying to groom it from his family. 
Um, so yeah, that's a great question, and, and probably the Central Asian countries could be included in this. Um, the tagline of the book, by the way, is that we're all lands in between, right? So in a way, every country in the world is living with this like geopolitical conflict right now and is affected in some way. And then, of course, very close to Russia as well. Um, the Putin's future, I'm a pretty optimistic person. Uh, so who asked the Putin's future? Is you, okay. So um, I'm pretty optimistic and I, I tend to look at this and I, I agree more or less with Bob that the Putin vision, uh, you could argue, uh, worked for a while or seemed like it was working for a while and is kind of in crisis right now, right? Because uh, oil prices haven't continued to rise, people's economic benefits are not increasing, they're kind of stagnating. And people more and more are questioning. You see in public opinion polls, he's losing you know, 20 points from where he was before. You know, and the trajectory is down, so say the opposition people I talked to in Russia. You know? And so, um, so I think that, that you have to say that his, his whole structure is not a great idea. Not, you know, and so I would think that anybody who came in after him, and that would include some you know, hard-bitten security types, right? would probably choose to take a somewhat more amenable view towards the West than Putin has. That's my view about it. I think if, if you sum up the strategy overall, you'd say that whether or not it's made for good reasons, whatever reasons he had behind the strategy, um, it didn't fully work out. And, and there's a way to have a Russian national identity without being quite as hostile to the West. Um, so that's what I would expect, but you know, time will tell um, about that. And we, you know, it depends how long, you know, we're wait, gonna wait around for this to happen too. Um, the, the last question, of course, um, is a great one. Um, you know, is there an actual alternative? Yeah, I guess to some level, you, you know, this nationalist, uh, sort of aggressive, let's buy Greenland, let's, let's conquer Crimea. We're returning to this 19th century kind of realist mode where territorial expansion of states is common where uh, trade wars happen more than trade agreements, right? You know, the, you know and that's, the, the problem I would say with that, it, it, just doesn't, it just doesn't make anyone safer. At the end of the day, it does not make anyone safer. And, and therefore, a lot of people are gonna resist it and have a lot of power and potential to resist that, right? I don't see how, you know, certainly within the European Union, what we've seen as a result of this conflict and as a result of Brexit is that the popularity of the European Union has increased among voters by like 10 percentage points on average, right? So people more and more believe in this Europe without borders and boundaries, a strong Europe, a you know, sort of multinational empire slash federation, right? As a model of, of conflict resolution because they look at these trends that they see of Russia pushing an alternative view and they say, We've been there. That's terrible. It's terrible. And it's going to result in utter disaster. And we don't want it, simply. And I think, frankly, people in a lot of Western countries are going to think that. Um, and I think that, um, that it's going to be a really hard sell. It's going to be a really hard sell. Now, it can, you know, I don't know that the answer is easy. I don't know that this, you know, it's easy to put the genie back in the bottle, you know, too much. Um, but I just, I just don't think that, um, you know, if it were really obvious, it would already be happening. I, I also don't think that it's going to be easy for uh, anti-system uh, states, you know, to sort of upend the liberal order either. Because if you think about it, you know, European Union is a much po more powerful actor than Russia in some certain dimensions, right, in the economic dimension. And so it's not like they're just going to be able to brush aside all these achievements that Europe has had in, in creating peace and security and prosperity, and, and people don't want it gone. So whereas, you know, I think, I think you may be right that there's, there's big challenges, obviously, and a lot of people feel like the liberal order is going away and waning. Uh, I think it has a lot of life in it left. And, and the reason it has life on it is, is what I've tried to tell you today. It works. It actually works. And, and so if you got something that works, like don't fix it, you know, and people when challenged are gonna realize that and they're going to um, vote the other way. And so I don't see the world owned by, you know, the kind of aggressive nationalism that, that tormented Europe in the 19th century or 20th century. I don't see that as being like a future people wanna return to. 
Um, but maybe that's again me being kind of optimistic about this all. <laughs> you know? But that's that is really you know just a parting word to say that is really the question. You know, in each election going forward in the world, that is the question, really, right? Do you want a world ruled by the laws of nationalism and the rule the the rule of the the strongest, or do you want a world rule you know ruled by by law by order, by agreement by interchange right international that's agreement. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm not it's, saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying it has to be right, but I mean that's the thing. Is so if it, if it were obviously beneficial, you know, yeah, and you know the U.S. can fight that game. The U.S. can play that game. We're we're pretty well set up to win in either circumstance, but I think even for the U.S., it's just not a game worth having because the wars that we fought, the devastating wars we fought in the last century, were all fought in Europe. Okay, over European security. And I would wager that we don't want to go back there, that after two of these devastating wars, we don't want to go back and get drawn into another European conflict. And it's always going to be in the US interest to support a more peaceful Europe um, based on these liberal institutions that we created. And we're not going to give them up quickly. Just as a little note on that, I would say, well, anyway, I sh I'll just leave it there. And thank you, Jerry. And um, uh, for well, thank you, thank Lindsay. Give him a round of applause. Thank you all for coming. Thanks again for. Mitch and the uh, Rachel and Jim Hodges Fund for supporting this. And uh, until the next time, probably in early uh, January. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your questions. Good stuff. <laughs>